Okay, we're going to just continue in the book of Ephesians. And for me, uh, a lot of... Um, I'm, I'm realizing that the longer I'm in ministry, that a lot of my job as a pastor is not necessarily to teach something new, but to remind God's church to, to remember what they already know in their hearts and to embrace it and to be grateful for it and to, and to worship the Lord because of it. And um, before we begin, though, I, I was really um, uh, focused on uh, Psalm 8 this week, and, and I really wanted us to remember again what kind of God we're coming here to worship this morning. And Psalm 8 says, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. When I consider the heavens and the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Um, the distance from the earth to the sun is 93 million miles. And if 93 million miles are represented by the thickness of a sheet of paper, the distance from Earth to the nearest star, the Alpha Centauri star system, which is four light years away, would be represented by a stack of paper 70 feet high. And if you go further out, Zoom out and you measure our Milky Way galaxy. The diameter of the Milky Way galaxy would be represented by a stack of papers 300 miles high. This is our God. This is the God that we serve. Hebrews 1, 2, and 3 says, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. And he is the radiance of the, his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Now imagine a God who holds these galaxies into place by the word of his power. This is just one of many galaxies. The God who created the universe. And here we are on one little planet that God perfectly created for humanity to thrive. And here we are, one person, in one location. And yet God, the Father, creates us in his image and adopts us as his children. After we have betrayed him, as we have dishonored him, as we rebelled against him, and he sacrifices the life of the second person of the Trinity on behalf of us. That is the God whom we are worshiping this morning. We can't come saying, God, you know, because I accepted you as into my heart, now you gotta help me, you know, you gotta you gotta be, you gotta help me do this, you gotta help me do that. Treat God as an assistant. <laughs> Let's bow our heads in prayer one more time um, before we deep dive into Ephesians again. Heavenly I mean, Father, we come to you asking you to, to create in us a clean heart. That you would renew a right spirit within us. Father, we acknowledge our sin to you. We acknowledge that we are selfish, we are prideful. We don't give you the honor that you deserve. 
Do not cast us away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from us, O oh Lord. But restore to us the joy of your salvation. Remind us of how much love that you have and what sacrifice that that love displayed. Purify us, O oh God. We know that you desire truth in the innermost being. We know that you not only are a loving God, but are a holy God, and we can't come even before your presence unless we are washed and renewed. So Lord, as we've come hungry to be in your presence, wash us thoroughly from our iniquity, cleanse us that we once would be again reunited with the Holy Father, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, I keep repeating this over and over again because rather than quickly going through the book of Ephesians, which is only six chapters long, whenever you hear the book of Ephesians, I want you to think, I know the book of Ephesians. It has six chapters. The first three chapters is all about the gospel and the wonder and the beauty of how God loves me and God's plan to for since the foundation of time to reconcile me back to him and to reconcile us back to one another. And the beauty of the gospel is not just about salvation. When I grew up as a little kid, that's all I ever heard the salvation. You've got to be saved. You've got to be saved. No, it's way more than salvation. He's adopted us. He predestined us for adoption for time and calls us his children. It's an entrance into a family with the God Almighty. And then chapters four through six, we're in chapter five, verse one and two today. Chapter four through six is all about, in light of everything that God has done for us, how then shall we live? Christians must live as new people in a manner worthy of our new identity and family. I want you to remember this always when you think of the book of Ephesians. Six chapters, first three about the beauty of gospel and all that God has done for us, who we are, our identity. The next three, in light of that, how are we supposed to live? Ephesians is packed with so much. And the key verse of Ephesians, again, I want you to remember this. I keep repeating this every time because I want you to think. I never realized how important unity was. And so I keep deep diving and unity seems to be popping up everywhere. What is this unity? Why is it so important? You know, last week as Pastor Peter was preaching about the body of Christ, and each one of us are so important and critical. You know, I couldn't help imagine God just painting a beautiful picture. This a masterpiece, but he was painting it on little puzzle pieces. And we are those pieces, right? And I feel like if we just think we're not needed, it's like making a puzzle, but that one piece is missing and you can't, it's not complete. You can't say one piece is more important because that has a different color than another. Or that has the image of the face of the picture and not and this one has the foot. The puzzle that God is, is, is painting, the masterpiece that God is creating, is incomplete without the body of Christ. Every one of us. That's why it's so beautiful to be in, in a smaller church where everybody has to chip in because we all, we can't survive unless everyone comes. And, and you know, it's it's amazing to see all the people who come set up the chairs, who put out the signs out front, who prepare the worship, who prepare all the things in the kitchen, who prepare you know, everything, who prepare the sound. It's it's amazing to see different people working, and it's all about. The unity of the body of Christ. It's so important, as a matter of fact. We'll, we'll go into this quote. I read this quote this week, and I was blown away by it. So this is the most creative social strategy we have to offer is the church. Here we show the world a manner of life the world can never achieve through social co coercion or governmental action. 
We serve the world by showing it something that it is not, namely a place where God is forming a family out of strangers. That's powerful. A lot of us are saying, this is the most important election in our lifetime. If the right candidate doesn't win, democracy is going to be destroyed. Yeah, both sides are saying that. Can't be right, right? But no amount of government is going to save us. As a nation, if, if we are to turn things around, the only thing that can turn things around is if the church starts being the church. If the church remembers who they are, how much they've been loved, and what their, what, what task God has given them. This unity is so important that Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, in John 13, 34, 35, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also must love one another. By this, all men will know. What will we know? By this, by what? By your love for one another. That they will know that you're mine, that you're my disciples, that you're followers of the risen Christ. Not by what you profess, not by coming to church on Sunday, not by how much you tithe. They will know who you are, that you are mine, that you belong to Christ by how you treat one another. Look what Jesus says on his deathbed. I mention this all the time because I want to keep reminding the church. Unity is important. It's so important, as a matter of fact, it was on his top priority list when he was about to die. His last words to his disciples was what? In his high priestly prayer. His last prayer for his disciples, I should say. His prayer for his disciples was that they would be one. Even as you, the Father, are in me and I in you, so that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Look at that last phrase. Why is unity so important? Because when the world looks at the church, they're going to decide who Jesus is based on who the church, how the church loves one another. This unity doesn't mean uniformity. And we're going to dive further into this. At the beginning of chapter 4, remember chapter 4 through 6 is in light of the gospel, in light of everything God has done for us, how should we look? You know what? You know what? Chapter 4 talks about, talks about the unity of the church. He says you've got to be united because unity reflects the oneness of God. The body of Christ must be built up until it reaches unity. As a matter of fact, speaking truth and love and unity and maturity, and God wants us to be mature. He wants His church to be strong, and that requires unity. I don't have the time to break it all down, but then we talked about from verse 17 through 24 of chapter 4 that we have to walk in the power of a renewed spirit of your mind. Put off your old self, put on the new. And then he talks about how do you do that? We've got to change the way we think. And the second half of chapter 4 talks about what does walking in a renewed spirit of your mind look like? And the central truth to sum it up was the outcome of our outward behavior is the result of the battle that has already occurred in our minds. To walk in a manner worthy of our calling, we must train our minds in truth. And that section was so good, it's like, um, I felt like I was digging for gold, and I, I hit gold in the book of Ephesians. 
And, and I, I took out another gold. There's still all this gold left, but then I didn't want to start digging in another place looking for gold. So I, I went back to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. We preached this, another message on the same verses. About the renewed mind. And we talked about what a renewed mind that we must recognize the tactics of the evil one, the father of lies, and how we got to recognize that the root of all the temptations begins with a lie. All the things that we struggle with begins with a lie from the father of lies. And to combat that, we talked about we have to speak truth. Remember, speaking truth and love is what also brings unity. So these things are all connected. And then, do not give the devil an opportunity. And the central truth was walking with a renewed spirit of your mind starts with recognizing the lies the enemy whispers in our vulnerable moments of weakness and speaking truth. Satan knows that each one of us have a weakness in our flesh. You know, the Bible summarizes the things of the world in three is less the flesh, the less the lies, and the of pride of life. And in those three things are variations of one of those three things we all struggle with. And Satan knows which one we struggle most with, and then he uses that. Starts speaking lies. And now we're in chapter five. But what word does chapter 5 start with? It starts with, therefore, right? So the first thing you have to do is go back and see what in the world is he talking about. We, we summed it up, but we're going to look at those verses really quickly. And I, for the sake of time, I might go really fast through this. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Therefore. But why? Well, now we've got to go back to chapter 4 again. I'll just start from 16. But he's, here he's talking about walk no longer in the futility of your mind. We, we've summarized this, but we're going to see these things from the scripture. Being darkened in our understanding, when we used to live in the futility of our mind before Christ, we lived in ignorance. Our hearts were hard. We were callous. We gave our lives to the lust of the flesh, to sensuality. Impurity, greediness. And he says, but you, you gotta walk differently. You gotta remember the truth of Jesus. 17 through 24. Lay aside the old self, put on the new. The lusts of deceit. And be renewed by the spirit of your minds. It starts with your mind. And what we choose to believe, what we allow into our minds. Put on the new self. It talks about the holiness of the truth. Because the battle is our mind, and we need to fight the lies with the truth. Therefore, lay aside the falsehood, the lies that the evil one is speaking into our minds. It challenges our identity, it challenges our goals, it challenges where, uh, what we're living for, and where we get our joy. But I want to go to the last verse. This is the last verse before he says, therefore, in the next chapter. The last verse says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. So in one sense, therefore, is everything that he was talking about, but specifically, I think he was talking about this last verse. Look at this last verse. Let's just focus on this last verse. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, the key words, just as, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Therefore, then he says, therefore, Forgiving each other just as God in Christ is also forgiven. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. How do we imitate God? Just as God forgave, we are to forgive. Oh. 
These are the two verses we're going to talk about. Therefore, be imitators. Therefore, because God has forgiven us, we also ought to forgive you we to imitate God. But some of us might say that's impossible. You don't know how much wrong has been done to me. The very people who were supposed to love me, the very people who to care for me, they betrayed me, they broke their covenant. They didn't love me. As a matter of fact, instead of love, they betrayed me. And I'm trying to forgive, but I'm only human. How can I do that? How can I love someone who's done that to me? How can I love a boss who's done that to me? How can I love a spouse who's done that to me? How can I? I know I'm supposed to love my child, but how can I love a child who's been so ungrateful to me after all that I've done? Humanly, it's impossible. Can you do it? I can't. I can't love people who hated me. I can't love people who betrayed my trust. It's hard for me to love a friend who thought was my friend, but then you get that stab in the back when it matters most. It's impossible. But in Christ, by looking at what He's done for us, the creator of the universe, chooses to separate and empty Himself, as Philippians talks about, to come to this earth to be mocked, suffered, tortured, and died. There is no amount of pain, no amount of betrayal, no amount of scorn that's greater than what Christ had to do. And on the cross, what does he say? I don't forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's still praying for them as they're killing him. And it's only when we remember how much we've been forgiven that we can forgive. And you remember we talked about how important unity was in the previous passages of Ephesians? Well, there's no way we can be united and mature unless we learn how to forgive one another. And some of us have been wronged more than others. And you know the pain and the betrayal and the hurt. There's only one way, though, for you to heal. The only way we can heal is by giving to others what we have already received, which is forgiveness. Is by remembering where we were. Where would we be if God said, I'm only going to, to love the ones who've been good. I'm only gonna love the ones who haven't failed. Or, serve, or didn't serve other idols. I'm only going to love the people who, where would we be? But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that what? While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we were good enough. That is the beauty of the gospel, chapters 1 through 3 in Ephesians. Chapters 4 through 6, remember, talks about how we should live. And it starts out with walk in unity. By speaking truth and love. And that will bring unity and maturity. And our worthy walk begins in our minds. And then now we are to walk in love. And what does it mean to walk in love? It means to imitate God as beloved children. And the key here is love children. 
And indeed, God, just as we can forgive only when we know how much we've been forgiven, we can only love when we know how much we've been loved. We can only imitate what we've received. We can't imitate what we don't know and, and haven't experienced. We walk in love because we are already loved, because we are already His beloved children. And walking in love means we forgive one another just as God has forgiven us. Look what it says. Let's look back at the first, the gospel in the first three chapters of Ephesians. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Before time as we know, He chose us that we will be blameless and holy before Him in love. He predestined us to adoption to His family as children. Salvation is so much more about being saved. It's about being part of His family. And a lot of people have a hang up with this verse because they say, well, wait a minute. I'm not sure about scripture now because where's our choice in this? Why can he blame us? How could God blame us if he chose before the foundation of the world? Now, again, remember how great God is. One of these days I want to do, I want to do a sermon on the greatness of God and, and on the theory of relativity. What does Einstein's theory of relativity say? Remember? It says that what? The time is relative. The time can, can, it's not necessarily linear. It's linear for us here on this earth. One moment comes after another. Right? But if you take a step back and look at time, if things start approaching the speed of life, time starts to change, it becomes fuzzy, and, and time can pass at a different rate for one person than another. Now think of an infinite God who's not bound by time, and then all your just problems with these verses go away about predestination and all this other stuff. Because God we serve is not bound by time, and our little minds cannot fathom what that is. How can we fathom a God of the universe who speaks galaxies into existence? We can't. There's no way. Anyway, I don't want to put all my time on that. Let's get back to Ephesians. And then the love of God. It says, look, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. We were dead in our transgressions, in our rebellion, in our idolatry, in our harlotry. But His great love, with which He loved us, look at that repetitiveness. He wants the readers, the Ephesians, to know that oh, you were so dearly loved. And He raised us with Him. And seated us in the heavenlies. Okay, now this is the next point. It's really tied to the first point. But I have to put it in the second point because I don't want you to overlook this. Love philanthropy. What in the world is love philanthropy? Alright, think about this. A philanthropist. My gift to this cause and my gift to this cause. And that's what a philanthropist does, right? Give his resources to causes he can say great. But every philanthropist, in order to be a philanthropist, has to have something else on this side where all his money comes from, right? It's generating his income into some, you know, some startup or some something where you get all this money, and when you have all this money, so much money you don't know what to do with, then guess what? You will start giving freely to others. That's what philanthropy is. That's just like what God's love In order to give love, we must have another source of love filling us up each day. Now, this is the problem for many of us. 
If we love our spouse more than God, if we love our children more than God, like loving our children, that's a good thing, right? It is until it isn't. When is it not good to love each other? When, when your love for your child is greater than your love for God. This is kind of weird, but the only way you can properly love your spouse and properly love your child is to love God more than your spouse and your child. Why? Let's think about this. Why? Because if I love my spouse the most, more than anything else in this world, or if I love my child the most, anything in this world, well, what if I love my spouse more than God, and my validation comes from my spouse, and my happiness comes from my spouse, right? That's what it means to love the most, right? Everything's coming. But what happens if my spouse, all of a sudden, one day falls into temptation, and whatever happens, and doesn't love me, and betrays me, or serves me in a way that is so, can I love my spouse the way I'm supposed to? No. Because now I'm utterly devastated, I have no other source of love. But if I love God first, not daily receiving all this incredible love, and my validation, my identity, and everything who I am comes from God, even when My spouse is in utter depression or something is wrong, has lost a job, and is, I don't know, maybe addicted to something, alcohol or whatever it may be, or this or that, or, or has some kind of thing. And it devastates you, but not fully. Because you may be heard and it may, but you still are receiving all this other love and you're still identity from here. And then even though it's humanly impossible because you're receiving all this incredible, miraculous love of God, even when the person who you're supposed to love isn't loving back, you could show the gospel and actually by trying to love that. Same thing with a child. What if you do everything first? You sacrifice, you scrape, you give the, your child the best, you give everything, you love them the most, and your relationship with your child is the most important thing in the world. And you want, your joy comes from looking at your child do well and flourishing, and, and your identity, I'm a good parent, a good father, a good mother. Everything's about your child. I'm gonna give them everything so they can succeed in life, and that's my happiness. My happiness is in my child. All these other things are wrong in my life, but I don't care. It's my child, I'm putting all my hopes. What happened when that child grows up? That child starts dating someone you disapprove of, and you tell them don't date, but they say no, and they still do it anyway. Do you see how this works? If your child is your, your number one and not God, when things go wrong, which it inevitably will because we live in a fallen world full of sin, you don't know how to cope, you can't love. You'll start getting bitter. It'll start to destroy you from the inside out. But if you're receiving all this love from God, you can it. Love for love for me. What is for You're giving people something that they don't really deserve, something that you don't have to, something that is not required or even expected, but you're doing it because you have all this from somewhere else. No matter how good our lives look on the outside, something will come up in your life. And if your trust is anywhere else besides God, it will turn your whole world upside down. How do we walk in love? We've got to imitate what God has done by forgiving as we've been forgiven, by understanding how much love we've received so that we can exercise love philanthropy, 
And finally, we have to walk in love by loving sacrificially. Look at this. What does it say? Walk in love. What? Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God as a free gift. How did Christ love us? Was it easy? It was the hardest thing in the world. Even the most amazing God man in the world at the Garden of Seven, he said, God, I don't want this. Take this cup from me, but not my own will. Um, that's the kind of love. Being forgiven, essential truth, allows us to forgive. Being sacrificially loved allows us to sac love sacrificially. Walking in love is remembering how much we have been forgiven and loved, and showing the world who Christ is by imitating Him. If we're having problems in our lives with our children, that's not the real problem. The real problem is that we're not receiving love every single day and filling our cups so that we can exercise love for life. If we're having trouble in, in our relationships at work, those things that we see as the outward problem are the symptoms of a deeper root cause of us not receiving that love, enough love from God so that we can. And God wants to pour that love in just filling our lives with other things so that it doesn't fit. There's no room. Just like no matter how much good food is in front of you, if you've just eaten three pounds of junk food, none of the good stuff is going to go in. In order to love, you gotta receive love. You know, um, I don't know about you, but Korea, uh, my mom, Korean moms have gone through the war and through all these hardships. They're amazing, because my dad went through the same thing, but I would never know I would have loved if it wasn't for my mom. Now, my mom went through this incredible hardship, same time my dad went through it, but it affected them both differently. I don't know, how, it, it seems like a common story. But my dad went, you know, he went, he was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. He wanted to love, but he had so much anger in his heart, he didn't know what to. And then he felt bad, and then he tried to love, but we were already mad because he didn't blow it up and drink this stuff. And we couldn't receive that now. And it was, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. But my mom, man, she was, she endured it all. She held our family together. And I only knew I was loved because of her. I, if, if you ask me, how do you know that, that, that you were loved? I have a, one memory, one vivid image that I'll never forget. And I always share this story. And I'll share it again. I'll probably share it like 10 more times in the future. But it's my parents' story. When we were very poor, we were just immigrated to the U.S. You know, just, just survival was the main thing, right? We were, to, we were living off my mom's seamstress channel. My dad was, used to be a professor in Korea, and he thought that he, he spoke English and he came to the U.S. and no one could hire him, no one could understand what he's saying, this is all book English. His pronunciation was so bad, so he took jobs as a janitor, and then he was too angry because it's like, I'm better than, I shouldn't be, and so he just couldn't hold down the job because he's too angry. So my mom worked at this seamstress. She would bring home bags of, of, of piece work to do, and us kids, we would do the little things day and night, and my mom would carry it on, and that's how we survived and went to the supermarket. It's like, we could buy all the bare necessities. Buying a piece of fruit was a luxury. I remember one time we went to the Korean supermarket, and we bought one pair for the five of us. Because that's what we could afford. And then none of us took our eyes off the pair because we all wanted our share and our, our other siblings. And we were like, I remember there's five of us left. I remember how my mom cut it. She cut it like this. Four nice big juicy pieces. And she gave to us. And she was gnawing on the core. 
And I, even as a little kid, and even in my own greed, I took the big piece. I wish I could say I offered that to my mom. No, I didn't. I devoured it in a second. <laughs> but I think it to my mom chewing on the core. That was the everlasting image for me that oh, my mom loves me. And when you receive love, you're able to give love. When you receive forgiveness, you're able to forgive forgiveness. If you've forgotten how much you have loved or how much you've been forgiven, then it's hard. It's in your name also. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray, thanking you for your word. How precious are your words, O Lord. That speak about your love for us. That remind us how great you are, and at the same time, how much you love us, and how much you sacrificed, how much you've forgiven us. And I pray, O oh God, that you would teach us to be imitators of you, as your beloved children, as your so well-loved children. Help us to love one another starting with the people you closest that you placed in our lives, whether it be family, people at work, our neighbors, help us, Lord, to exercise love for that for me. Help us, O oh Lord, to forgive when we've been wronged. Help us, O oh Lord, to be united as the family of God so that the world will know that you have sent the Son. We thank you, Father, and pray all these things.